We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Welcome back, Tom. He's back from vacation two weeks gone I am. by. That's right. Here he is. Hello. I am. It was, it was less of a va- vacation and more of a forced march through other states. <laughs> okay. All right. My wife, I, don't, I, I, I don't know how this happened because uh, I've never been a super... I mean, I guess when I was in high school, whatever, everybody, or elementary school, middle school, your, kid, your parents were always making you do sports and stuff. Sure. I never really felt like I was a super active, like, got to play sports kind of kid. And, mm-hmm. you know, oh, so there's a pickup game or something. I'm going to go around out there and do it. That was, that was not really me. But somehow, in the midst of this marriage, we have gotten to the point where we like to go hiking and yeah. we we get mad if the hikes are wussy <laughs> or if there's too many people there so i we guess look for it's things. experience well it, there's what happened the the long version it well let's do the short version the short version of what happened is we went to new york during a uh, hurricane whatever it was that would came through here and where i left the state okay and my my cousin's friend is a climber and she my cousin told her that we were climbers, which is true mostly. My wife doesn't really climb. And she's like, oh, if they're climbers, then they should do this hike, which ended up being what's called a scramble. A scramble is like, you wish you had a rope, but you're kind of going to be fine without one because you know what you're doing. And, you know, so it gets steep. It gets a little treacherous. There's, you know, stuff that, you know, people, a lot of people won't do. Well, my wife, while she was terrified the entire time, and I had to, like, help her through most of it, Mm -hmm. uh, she loved it. So now, like, we went to Arches National Park, which is in Utah, and uh, we went up to, like, the double arch, and there's a bunch of people there, and my wife just got irritated. I got irritated, but she also <laughs> got irritated and said, this sucks, and we're not going anywhere where there's going to be people anymore. So, <laughs> Well, that, so we, that could be a challenge, but all right. <laughs> we had, There was plenty of places, because there was stuff like, oh, if you want to go here, there's a kind of sketchy part at the very beginning, but then it's a one-mile hike in and a one-mile hike out. Well, the kind of sketchy place at the beginning is like 90 percent of the people will hit it and go nope i'm mm. out i'm not doing this but you know so we we had a good time we stayed with friends in denver we went all over denver we went to boulder we visited the campus there uh I don't, it's not called uc boulder but it should be it's the i don't know anyways uh they call it cu but the boulder university for my son who's only going to be a sophomore but kind of wanted to we were there so you might as well beautiful campus absolutely phenomenal uh climbing everywhere i'm a climber so i love i love that we did some climbing then we went to moab utah and spent you know about three or four days there and had a fantastic time as well so well that's good uh, yeah it was great it was great it was great but at the end of the the end of the vacations the kids were like we don't want to hike anymore i'm like mm. we're just gonna do one more it'll be fine <laughs> we're just doing one we literally we literally this is how we we entered moab we had no place to stay we had no lunch or food with us so we rolled into town and the first thing i see is a sign for climbing guides so i pull over we schedule a climbing trip this is 1 30 we schedule a climbing trip for 4 p.m mm-hmm. we have no plate we have no hotel we have no food <laughs> no water or anything so we had to like scramble and on our way out we drove eight hours from or it's supposed to be like six but ended up being closer to nine but because of weather but and construction but we drove uh on our way from moab back to denver which we drove straight before we left before breakfast we did another hike <laughs> so Jeez. we were a little little crazy but we had a good time so i'm um, welcome back to me and uh, welcome to all those people who betrayed me by doing the podcast with you while i was gone oh so, sure yes lee, you're, no lee big, you're still dead to me big thanks to lee overstreet uh and then of course huge thanks to uh richard gunther last week who uh special guest co-host uh, wanted to have on the podcast a long time and answered a whole bunch of specialized questions that were just for him all about uh, diy home automation if you haven't checked out episode number 653 so uh yep cool. we're here it's 654 tom's back back to our regular answering home theater and AV questions. 
There we go. So this is an AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To go get your question answered, all you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment there when the website works. I know. It'll be back up August 1st. And you'll have to replace the links for the two episodes that I made because I'm I'll not going to keep posting those. <laughs> I, have to, I have to go get that. Uh, let's see. Um, why is it so hot in here? I'm going to have to eat Because it's this summer thing. in Florida. <sighs> It was so nice. Denver, like, it cools down at mm-hmm. night. You know about this. I do. You live in Vancouver. Yeah. Right? It cools so it's down hot. Here. It's like 100, 100 degrees during the day. At night, it's like 73. I'm like, we get, may- during the summer, maybe 10 degrees of difference. Mm. And that's saying something. Not Celsius. Yeah. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yeah. A lot of times, it's like five. Yo, know, it's it's 95 <laughs> during the day. I am and never going 87 there. 87 at night. It is <laughs> awful. But, uh, avrant.com okay uh facebook.com slash avrant podcast youtube.com slash avrant where you can watch our live streams when we do them when they're fancy is. now they're all obsy they're, they're all bsy yeah. uh let's see you can contact robert directly at robert avrant.com his twitter is at first reflect i'm tom at avrant.com my twitter is at avrant underscore tom and now the camera's not offset so i feel more normal looking at it that's right all right, so we're going to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, all you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to www.avrant.com. Click on the buy, uh, buy us a cup of coffee link. When it works. Yeah. When the website's up. It works when the website is up. Be all right. We want to thank, and that's a PayPal donation site. We want to thank Stefan, Brandon, Brian, and Tim for doing that this week. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, as I mentioned over the past couple of weeks, uh, I didn't know if anybody was donating because I don't get to see those. But uh, as promised, Tom is back. We get the names since our last donors from, what, three weeks ago at this point. So Stefan, Brandon, Brian, and Tim, thank you all very much for financially supporting us via PayPal. Sounds like I'm like like embezzling from you when you say I can't see that. Oh, I can't. It's the truth. I don't well, see the I know PayPal you can't donations. See it because it's my PayPal account. I, I, mean, I can't make it. I like pay for stuff out of that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, and we only think our 83 patrons over at patreon.com. Patreon's a service where you can sign up for a monthly subscription to your content creator of choice or choices. And some people have chosen us to be one of them. So thank you to our 83 patrons. That's right. That's patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up, think of it as an automatic monthly donation. And thanks very much to our 83 patrons over there. Right. We also, if you can't support us financially, that's fine. Just figure out some way to support us in another way and let us know what you did and we will mention you. So we want to thank Andy who let us know that he reached out to Gek for some free room acoustics advice and mentioned to them that we sent him there. And Thomas for talking us up for, to Gary Yakubian and the rest of the SVS team when he attended a live SVS demo event. So thank you, Andy and Thomas. Yeah, Andy, Thomas, thanks very much for talking us up to Gick and to uh, Gary Yakubian and the SVS team respectively. We appreciate that. I'm logging into Ego B. This is ridiculous. I, I thought that the, I thought I had this thing set down. My AC is a mess too. We came home uh, and it was it all seems. broken. Yeah, so we're we're highly considering replacing our AC, which is a chunk of change, but I just can't deal with this anymore. Yes, no, I'm sure you would laugh heartily because I I picked up a portable mini split. All right, usually mini right. split AC systems have to be installed, but this is like a portable one comes with like a 10 foot hose. You stick one thing yeah. on the balcony, the other one goes yeah. through a little hole in the door, and yeah. inside it goes. And uh, I've actually run it a little bit here, and I think we've gotten up to uh, 25 or 26 Celsius. And I've been running my. That's AC. not even that warm. <laughs> that's like that's like that's just comfortable. Oh, too hot for me. <laughs> I like it below 20. <laughs> yeah so while i was in uh, denver and utah uh some friends of ours they went and flew up to like calgary and then drove to vancouver and then okay. took the train down to portland and then flew back to the united states sure to, to, the, to here so i got to see a lot of whitewater rafting and snow pictures and stuff like that so that was kind of cool too that's us you guys have snow. I saw snow the second day I was there. We went to the top of Mount Evans, which oh yeah, is good over Colorado, four, sure, yeah, yeah, over fourteen thousand feet. And uh, when you're from Florida, and the day that's <laughs> the, the the within twenty four hours of getting to Colorado, you drive directly up to fourteen thousand feet. Mm. When you step out of the car, mm. you you it is a fight not to pass out. I mean, <laughs> I could not breathe out. I was yeah. like, my kids were like, oh, I can feel the difference. I could like I go up the stairs, it feels different. I'm like, you guys are a bunch of wusses. I stepped out of that car. I was like. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> no, no, this is a real, real thing that <laughs> this is a thing that I didn't think was real. That is clearly real. So yeah, that was uh, 
that was something. That was really something. All right. Uh, in the news, any quick thoughts about the deluge of TV and movies coming? No, I have not paid any attention to SCCC. Okay. Yeah, it was San Diego Comic Con. That was that was last week. We didn't have a, any time with Richard to talk about it, even though no. he actually would have liked to have probably mentioned some of these things. But no, we we were busy last week there. So uh, I don't know. There were quick things that are, that popped out to me. Uh, the Orville, which is a show that I really do enjoy, uh, but it's moving exclusively to Hulu for season three. It will not be broadcast on the Fox Broadcast Network. That's so fine with me. I don't know in Canada what's going to happen there because we don't have Hulu yet. Although Disney said once they la- launch Disney Plus that they'll bring Hulu to Canada. Uh, but then again. Again, many shows that have been available exclusively on American streaming services in Canada, one of our stations picks it up. So it wouldn't shock me if like our space channel picked up uh, the Orville because it would definitely fit what they sure. usually broadcast. So could be that type of thing. Not quite sure, but I don't know. Exclusively on Hulu. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, so I, I've been not paying attention to anything out of there because I haven't seen Endgame yet. And okay. knowing what's coming out in Phase 4 tells me too much about what happened in Endgame. Oh. So I'm not paying well, attention to Well, it doesn't really... I don't these, care. Some of these they things are bef- th- taking place before Endgame. And some of these, whatever, dude. I'm just telling you, I don't want to know anything. Endgame's coming out in like. Well, you can't see this weeks. image I'm about to show anyway, because Marvel did talk all about their Phase Four at right. a huge press conference and all that stuff. Starting off with Black Widow, which I'm, I'm sure you have already heard of, yeah. and the Eternals. Uh, Angelina Jolie is going to be in that, so that was a thing. Who are, I don't remember who the Eternals are. Aren't they They're like not... the elder gods of the Marvel universe or some such? I don't really know. Well, there are a there. there there's Eternity, which is a personification of the universe. But there's yeah. Eternal, I don't remember. I've 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 tried to like stay up on my comic book mythos, but it's just there's too many. There are, it, there I, is. Too I much. get. I, I think I'm getting the Eternals and the New Gods, which is a DC. Thing, well, and yeah, New Gods is DC. Side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mixed up uh in my head so i have to go look look up what the eternals are again i'm not quite sure well yeah if nothing else will spur you to do that but there were a ton of disney plus shows mentioned and they mentioned them as being part of phase four so unlike the netflix marvel shows which they seem to have completely disavowed at this point oh, as yeah, ever no having doubt. existed especially well, they're since... gonna have that guy from luke cage play that's right Black, mahershala uh, ali is blade. now gonna be blade so he was I don't already know if I see that dude i i, I oh well, I, I he's such a good actor guy's... He's got. A, he's a great actor. He's got a great voice, but mm-hmm. I mean, Wesley I don't have Snipe, any doubts. He can be I mean, played. He can be played fine. And, and you know what? When people are like, "Oh, we need to bring back Wesley Snipes, dude." No. If you heard the story, have you read anything about the stories about what happened on Blade <laughs> Three, the the set of Blade Three? Wesley Snipes was out of freaking control. That's why he's imagine. barely in that movie. He like <laughs> locked himself in a drug fueled whatever in his trailer and one that come out and was threatening the director and had body the it was insane the fact that they don't have wesley snipes in there is like uh well, of course i mean i loved him in the first two movies the third yes. movie was a dumpster fire but uh yeah i absolutely 100 cannot blame anybody from saying oh i'm, I'm working with Web- wesley snipes after that no you kidding know, so uh looking forward to uh so like natalie portman didn't want to have anything to do with the marvel movies but they've they've enticed her back because she will become mighty thor as as jane foster See, did in the i comics, feel like that's so. a spoiler that's not a spoiler I, I feel like that tells me something about the avengers then you're wrong okay that's, that's good i want to be wrong <laughs> <laughs> don't spoil me but she'll and be I there know, you know, I, I, you know anybody who's like oh he's being ridiculous i know mm-hmm. i know i'm being ridiculous i refuse to go to the movie theaters and see movies anymore i'm sorry i didn't pay i mean get all this stuff in this room and you know set it up and spend all the time and effort to do this to go and to watch somebody <laughs> you know look at their facebook feed while i'm watching yep. a movie or talk or explain the the history of every single character as they come on screen or have kids doing whatever and most of the kids that are bugging me are my kids yes and he, at least here i can stop the movie <laughs> and say get out and then rewind it and see what i missed you sure can Anyway, That's why we going. do home theater. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Kevin Feige was up there on stage, and uh, and he specifically mentioned afterwards, he's like, I didn't even have time to tell you about, well, mutants coming to the Marvel Universe and the Fantastic Four, but that'll be after Phase 4. So, yep, that's uh, obviously all happening with Disney's acquisition of Fox and getting the right. rights back to those characters. So there it is, some interesting, fun stuff coming to Marvel's Phase 4. 
Yeah. <laughs> there was also a ton of Star Trek news. Uh, they're like making a bunch of news. like Star Wars is making all the money. That's Can't right. Can we have some of the money? Marvel's Can making all the a- money. Let's let's make some. It's all going to be on CBS All Access streaming exclusively. So that's the home of Star Trek now. Uh, but the main so thing is bad. that the Picard trailer looked very good. And uh, and so there you go. That's that's really all I cared about. The Alfred trailer from the ah, right. Pennywise looks awesome. Pennyworth. <laughs> Any worth, whatever. Any he wise is not it. He's also not a be a good movie, <laughs> a good TV series to watch. Uh, Any wise, you know how he turned to the dark side. Dude, he's a clown. <laughs> he was always dark. All right. So, do you really want some uh, Sonos speakers at IKEA prices? They've teamed up with the new IKEA Symphonic. 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 Yeah. Symphonic. I don't know. Maybe I transpose that to say. S and K <laughs> Symphonics. <laughs> Fon- is, this, is it isk. Fon Ix? It's a fon isk. I don't know. It's just hard to get your... What is it? Your, no, it's isk. To... It is k- SK. I typed that correctly. I was yeah. not wrong. Yeah, that's what it says here. That's messed Anyways, up. Anyways, the if, IKEA <laughs> Symphonisk speakers, that's which will be right. available August 1st, the $99... When the website goes back live, by the way. Uh, the $99 IKEA bookshelf speakers, which I'm not going to pronounce anymore because it's stupid. Yeah. It's the least expensive Sonos speaker ever. You can wall mount it and also mount it horizontally. You use it as a little shelf. Shelf. You could use any speaker as a shelf if you try hard enough, that, but whatever. That, but see. Uh, they stick in the hole about six, six and a half pounds. Early reviews say it doesn't sound all that great. Then there's a $180 lamp. It's basically a Sonos Play 1 speaker inside, and the early reviews say it sounds pretty good. So, you know, for a lamp, <laughs> as lamps go. That's right. <laughs> now, the Sonos the Play 1 is pretty, pretty, pretty decent, so that's, yeah. So, okay, so the lamp mm-hmm. in general like what do you use a lamp for and the really the only time i ever use a lamp is for reading so do i want music playing while i'm reading is the real question i mean it also makes it easier to put you know speakers around a room without having to well that's just it if you got them on end tables on either side of your couch and sonos does have the thing that allows you to do use a pair of wireless speakers as your surrounds uh when made it to one of their sound bars keep in mind for 180 bucks that ain't bad that's not too bad although of course you would need two of them so but uh, well, but it is also a lamp, so you're not getting nothing. <laughs> and it also blends in well with your decor. Which That's the main. When we have people that are really super concerned about that, we That's should right. keep that in the back of our minds as an option. Like I can't yeah. have anything that looks like a speaker. I'm like, well, can you have something that looks like a lamp? And then you have to also buy the rest of it as Sonos as well, and it's it all going to yeah. be super expensive. They're locking but you in. But what you do is you get you say, here's how I can do it to make it look like lamps. It's going to cost us five grand. <laughs> or I can make it look like speakers, and it's going to cost me seven hundred dollars. <laughs> so, which one do you want, honey? All right, let's get to the questions because we got a lot of them. Rusty, Rusty has always made do with a living room setup, but he now he finally gets to use his basement. He doesn't get a fully dedicated theater room though. It's a large open space. It's sixty feet long. 18, 60 feet long. It's the whole basement, that sounds like. That's, That's what it sounds like to yeah. me. Yeah, I mean, it's got to have some support columns in there someplace. But I would whatever. imagine. 60 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 8, and, uh, eight feet high in total. It's about uh, 9,000 cubic feet. That's right. The theater is in the middle. So the left is an office, and the right is his kid's play area. So it's, he's using the 18-foot dimension as a front-to-back distance. He sits 6 feet off the back wall and 12 feet from the front wall. Each side wall is 30 feet away. I mean, from the middle. I mean, yeah. It's probably 29 feet away, but whatever. <laughs> from the ear. From your shoulder. <laughs> so I don't know how wide this dude is. He could be extra wide. All right. At the moment, he's using a BIC F12 subwoofer, and it's sorely lacking. Yes. The yep. BIC F12 subwoofer was never meant to be put in a 9,000 cubic feet. It's a, it's a nice little decent sub, but not for 9,000 cubic feet. Yes, it, it is lacking. So he has it in mind that he'd like a pair of subs capable of hitting full reference volume, and there is actually space right in the middle of the 60-foot walls where large subwoofers could go, and children and, <laughs> and office equipment could be bounced. Middle of the front wall, middle of the back wall, it's just that the side walls are 30 feet away to either side. A little unusual, but still good placement. Yeah. Uh, so what would be the best value, he asks. Uh, would the dual S- uh, SU or HSU VTF-15H Mark II get the job done, or does he need a larger, more expensive subwoofer model? I don't know if you need more expensive, because there's at le- there's ex- least there's cheaper, larger subs that exist in the world. Right. But you definitely, I think you need bigger than this. Um, Although not tremendously so. Yeah. Um, so I just saw something from, I don't, I think it was Rhythmic? Could it be. was like an 18-inch mm-hmm. driver in the middle of a box, 
And mm -hmm. there was like a goodly amount of space on either side of that driver. Yeah. And then it was very tall, like uh, like at least as tall as like a dining room table, mm -hmm. I would think. But look at it with a with like two or three ports at the bottom of this thing. I'm like that's a massive sub, and then that could go. That could go in here. <laughs> that, <laughs> it could do that it. Is. I mean, I, I'm looking for the least expensive that can just do what he's asking, right. and I'm 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 truly what I'm going to recommend is truly the just asking. And actually, you probably don't even need it. But he said full reference volume, and now we got to keep in mind that full reference volume in the LFE, the dedicated low frequency effects channel, while the signal could request as much as 115 dB peaks. Full reference volume literally means just above 110. Like anything above 110 is considered full reference volume in that low mm. frequency effects channel. So uh, going strictly by the numbers, the Shu VTF 15H Mark II. Now, an interesting thing in this room is that he actually has a dimension, 60 feet, so large that he is not getting room gain in that dimension, even right. at 20 hertz. Right. It's one of the very like few rooms. 55 feet is a 20 hertz. Fif yeah, 55 to 56 feet, that's that's 20 hertz. So that one of the few rooms we've come across where he is genuinely not getting any room gain in that dimension. Now, you take any sub from the anechoic measurement and put it in any room that isn't 60 feet in every dimension, <laughs> and you automatically get three decibels of gain. And then you put it up against a wall or two walls, and you get three decibels of gain, usually for each wall that you put it against. But in his room, he wouldn't. At most, he would get an additional three decibels of gain by putting it in well and even in a corner he would only get in his particular room an additional uh so six total one from the ceiling floor and one from the front to back so that means we need a sub that anechoically can truly play 110 decibels right and his seating distance is enough that i'm not really worrying about you know distance measurements you know, the the cta uh, 2010 measurements are done at two meters so if you can hit anechoically 110 decibels at two meters i consider that fine well the shoe vtf 15h will hit 109 108.9 so if we're really skimming it and so technically speaking it won't get you what you want but for just a hundred dollars more which i don't think is insanely more expensive Power Sound Audio's V1510. So not their down-firing 15-incher, but their front-firing one, which is a little bit bigger than their down-firing one. Uh, and you can get a pair of those for $2,200 shipping included. Now, it is 24 inches. Uh, is that... That's the height, I think. I think it's 24 inches high, 17 inches wide, and 25 inches deep. This is a large box, but... It's about the smallest that can actually get you full reference volume. Now, if you were saying, I want 115 decibels, and just don't. You got kids potentially beside you. This is like, you don't need 115. But then you're looking at, yeah, something like the 18 incher that Tom is talking about. But this is the least expensive pair of subs that you can get that will genuinely hit full reference volume. You can get a pair for 2200 bucks. A pair for $2,200. That's yes. that's pretty cheap. That 18 incher I'm looking at, I think, is $1,799 by itself. That's right. Yeah, because they're 1150 each, but if you pair them up, they give you a $100 discount over at Power Sound Audio. And shipping is included. So given that the shoe VTF 15H Mark IIs would have cost you $2,100 after shipping for a pair of them, uh, I like, well, you spend the extra hundred bucks and you get the genuine full reference volume. I'm trying to see what the, what the, how loud it can get. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the uh, performance tab there yeah, in that I'm power center. Now they list their CTA 2010 measurements reference to one meter. So you have to subtract nine decibels from what they're listing there. But oh, when no, you I'm do, looking, I'm looking at the rhythmic. The, oh, that, the rhythmic. It's FV18. That's yes, yes, the FV18. Yeah. Stupid. That is their model. They don't list CTA 2010 measurements over here. They don't. Day. I'm looking for it. It's not yeah. Yet. So you'd have to go over to a database, and I'm not sure if he's measured that one yet. But uh, yeah. In any case, pretty darn close to that shoe price tag, and it'll actually get you there to full reference volume. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he's using a 2.1 setup for the moment, but he'd like a full Atmos configuration eventually. Where should he put his side surround speakers? Hey, how do you feel about lamps? <laughs> Uh, not for this. <laughs> no. Speakers on stands would end up being in the walkways, going to the office and uh, and the kids' play area, so those are pretty much a no-go. He could theoretically put speakers on the actual side walls, 30 feet to either side. 29, technically, but whatever. Uh, but that seems a bit nuts. Uh, could he put them on the ceiling? Uh, he could put them on the ceiling, but would that sound okay when he also wants Atmos speakers? What's the best solution? Okay, so 
there's really no problem with putting them on those side walls. They are far away. Right. That is that is that is kind of the issue. But you will, by definition, get a very diffuse sound. In, 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 I, mean, <laughs> yes. I don't know. I, I wasn't thinking that as my first choice because that's that's way over there. You need some efficient speakers and probably some beefy amps to get you thirty. That's right. Feet. That's yeah, that, that would be the real issue here. Is you it would, would. Need some sort of horn loaded like oh, yeah. clutch like. Or one of those compression drivers. Yeah, JTR or something. Yeah, Yeah. something like that to do it. Uh, You know, you're sitting six feet off the back wall. That's right. And, you know, I know that we always say, you know, where you want to put them is to your sides, a little bit to your sides and a little bit up, uh, which would be optimal. Uh, Sure. If you want to have Atmos someday, I think your only option is to really put them behind you. you Yeah, on your back wall. Off to the sides. Yeah. And, and you certainly have the width of your room that you can put them quite far to your sides on the back wall. In fact, you could do that enough that you're still within Dolby spec. Right. Because uh, even, if, even if you're thinking that you want surround back speakers, uh, meaning that your surround speakers, your side surround speakers, Dolby would have you put those between 90 and 110 degrees behind you. Well, 110 degrees behind you would have them 16 and a half feet to your left and 16 and a half feet to your right on your back wall. I mean, right. theoretically, I'm looking the at a 60, angle works 60 out. foot long room that that seems like you could actually do that. And if you decide that instead of having surround backs, because you're just going to stick to a five speaker system, which only six feet behind you, definitely you could do uh, there. You could have your, um, surround speakers like Dolby would have them at 120 degrees you could have them at as much as 135 degrees uh, and that's still okay within a five you know 5.1 as the base layer system right and that means they could be a mere 10 feet to your left and 10 feet to your right on your back wall and that seems entirely doable to me because I mean even if this room is perfectly divided into thirds 20 feet for the office 20 feet for your theater 20 feet for the kids playroom that that's 20 feet they're on the borders I would of aim your them theater towards area. your uh, your couch though oh at that point yes definitely yeah. but I I, so that, I don't really see a reason times I will say that about surround speakers right. usually surround speakers we no matter what surround surround backs we say just point them straight in yeah. from the wall so that you're off from axis room. from them but in this Normally. case, you're going to be sitting so far away. I mean, right. 10 feet is not so far away. But... Yeah, well, 10 feet to your sides and 6 feet behind you. So yeah. that's some distance. That's some distance there. So, And then if you think about it, there'd be speakers out wide. And then if you wanted to go surround backs, you'd put them right off the right off the ends of your couches, basically. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and the, then there would still be enough separation. I mean, a lot of times we're talking about... Yeah, you about still could, yeah. Dolby Atmos speakers that are, you know, in line, you know, Dolby, you know surround... You know, top um, top middles are in line with kind of in line with your your surrounds, mm-hmm. and they're usually if we say they're you know five feet of difference, that's usually enough. Yeah. It, you know, and sometimes it's less than that. So, yeah, I think you'd be fine doing oh, it yeah. that way. I, if I would you put really your, want to surround backs. Yeah, I would put your surround speakers on your back wall for sure. If you spread them, you know, quite wide apart, then surround backs could still make sense. Right. And just remember, though, that this is going to be, I mean, you're looking at more than 12. If you put them 10 feet apart, then you got six feet. You know, if you look at, think of the, whatever the long angle is, the hypotenuse, is that what it is? I can't mm-hmm. remember. Uh, that's going to be more than 12 feet. So, yeah. you know, you're looking at, you want to speak that's fairly efficient, mm-hmm. if you can get it. And, uh, you know, just realize that if you if you go for the cal- through the calibration and your receiver sets the mm. surrounds at, plus 12 right you need an amp <laughs> you know, yes. basically yeah it basically is what that means is that you need an amp it's just telling you straight up that's what you need all right stefan stefan has a Marantz sr 7012 he's using it to power seven speakers in his 15 and a half by 16 and a half foot room a couple weeks ago we told several people that they had setups where they could benefit from adding separate amps i go away for two weeks and you guys are recommending amps around here it's what happened don't somebody give me was, that crap somebody we was don't recommend like 15 amps. feet away we don't do amps we don't recommend amps. It's not what we do. When it's when the math says that it's time to have one, then there it is. I don't lie. Fifteen and a half by sixteen and a half foot room. Does he need an amp? No. Almost certainly not. <laughs> Unless you have really inefficient speakers and you have them plastered against your front wall and, and you are plastered against your wall. back wall. Yeah. 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 
that's almost that you would really on walls and you sit on wall and that's it's not right. the same wall. <laughs> and even then you'd still need quite inefficient speakers to get you to the point where mathematically you would need a separate amp. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this room size, I can't imagine you're sitting more than 12 feet away. I mean, because your speakers have some depth to them. They're probably not plastered right against the front wall. So they're, let's say, two feet off the front wall and you're two feet off the back wall. I mean, at a minimum, that's 12 feet in this room that you are right. from your speaker. You, you don't need an amp. No. So he asked, could we clearly explain what separates are really about? It's just very <laughs> similar to uh, a convertible car when you're a middle-aged man. That's what separates are about for 99% of the people who own them. That I will say that, and I feel confident with that number. 99% of the people in the home theater game who own separates own them because it is bling and yeah. it makes them feel good. Oh, I mean, I'm sure I, I have zero doubt if he's read any websites or home theater magazines or audio magazines or whatever, that of course somebody somewhere has been touting how amazing separates are. How yeah. well, of course, if you can afford it, you would get separate. Why would you go with an all-in-one box that tries to do so many things? It can't possibly do it as well. Yeah, as like your car can't boxes. drive and do the radio at the same time. Clearly, <laughs> right. if we could find a car that didn't have a radio it would go faster because the radio is the problem there it has nothing to do with the engine whatsoever so i mean to give you some numbers to go by stefan any reasonable speakers that have uh, specifications listed for them by a manufacturer that has any idea what they're doing you'll see an efficiency or a sensitivity spec right and i mean we can we could go way down into the weeds of describing all this stuff but i'm not going to you just look at that number and you're going to see something like around 86 decibels or maybe if they're efficient maybe over 90 or something like that but 86 87 89 86. those 86. are is yeah. a very reasonable number to see with the 8 ohm speaker. Exactly. Very, very common to see. And that number is referring to almost always one watt of power being fed into those speakers with the microphone or the listener being one meter away, about three feet away. All right. So every time you double your distance some from one meter to two meter or from two meter to four meter, and that's usually about where we stop because most people aren't sitting more than 15 feet away. Maybe you are, but that's pretty typical for a home. So one to two or two to four, every time you double that distance in an actual room, if you were outside with no walls around you, you would sub subtract six decibels for every doubling of distance from that number. But in a real room, I usually say to subtract four, and that's probably conservative. But mm. that's usually about where you are to subtract about four. So let's say you're sitting a full four meters away. You subtract eight decibels from that. Maybe you're at 78 decibels with one watt at this point. One watt of power into that speaker is giving you about 78 decibels of output from a standard 86 decibel per one watt per one meter speaker. Amplifier power, every time you double the amplifier power, so from one watt to two watts or two watts to four watts, you get three decibels more output. So you can use that, the other quick shorthand to quickly get the number of it is every time you multiply the number of watts by 10, so from one to 10 and from 10 to 100, the decibel number will go up by 10. That's, that's easy to remember. 10 times as many watts gives you 10 more decibels because it is a logarithmic scale. So that's exactly how that would go. So you can very quickly figure out how many watts you actually need to hit whatever given decibel level you want with those speakers from whatever distance you're sitting. And that's why we're saying you're at 12 feet almost certainly or closer. So you're probably closer to two meters than you are to four meters, but you're probably right around three meters. That's where most people are sitting. It's right around right. three meters. You've probably subtracted somewhere in the range of six decibels from that efficiency and sensitivity scale that we're looking at. So with one watt, you're probably getting at least about 80 decibels out of that thing. And that means with a hundred watts of power, you're hitting a hundred decibels. <laughs> right? Yep. That's that's kind of the math we're looking at here. And then you double that to 200 watt peaks and you're at 103, you're basically at full reference volume at that point. So your AV receiver is almost certainly rated at 100 watts per channel in these days if, you know, that's that's pretty reasonable. Audio Hawks is measuring most of the uh, AV receivers that we're talking about and they actually do deliver that. And not only that, if you measure what they can burst their power at for a short amount of time into any one given channel, they're often hitting like sometimes like 300 watts these days. That's really not uncommon for that really short little peak burst. So the people who need external amplification mm -hmm. and uh, of the people who need it, 
most of the time they need it because they have made some very esoteric speaker choices. Or they're the sitting very far away. Yeah. So what happens is you end up with something like a Martin Logan speaker or a another mm. type of electrostack, which dips right. into very low homage. And what yes. this means is that it is drawing an immense amount of power. Yeah. But only at certain frequencies and sometimes only for a very you know very short period of time. But so, it still might be legitimately requesting a thousand or twelve hundred watts from an amplifier channel right. for a brief amount of time at a certain frequency. But it, it can legitimately happen with certain speakers. At which point, a AV receiver just can't deliver that. That's right. So you know, it's so rare that that's the case. Right. Though it's so rare that that's the case. Uh, you know. Every, I've been in probably three people's homes who who own Martin Logan speakers. Sure. I have never seen anybody that sat further away mm -hmm. than maybe 10 feet mm. from Martin Logan speakers, which means that as long as they're not trying to throw a rave in that house, most of the time they don't even need the amplifier. You know, they're, they're sitting close enough that if they're just watching TV, which most of these people are doing, mm -hmm. or you know, listening to music. And not at full reference volume. Right. Not at full reference volume. They're watching TV or listening to music because almost in, in many cases, it's somebody who's been, uh, it's not a dedicated theater. It's not a dedicated theater room. So yeah. they are, you know, they have common walls and stuff. So they're not trying to blast it. Most of the time, they don't even need amps. Could they use it? Yeah, they could. But yeah. most of them... Didn't, don't need it. So, so yeah, Stefan, I, I'm going strictly by the objective numbers, and and there there absolutely are cases where separates are uh, mathematically required. If you're like, yeah. this is the level I want to hit. Here's how far away I sit. Here are the speakers that I use, and this is the way it's all going to go. And you're like, yep, you legitimately need a more powerful separate amp. That can totally be the case, but most of the time it isn't. And this this notion that somehow separates are just inherently better than a right. good AV receiver. Uh, no, that is... Uh, it's not the case. The blind listening tests tell us otherwise. Well, all of us do have separates to an extent because we all have subwoofers. And sure. that subwoofer has its own <laughs> its amplifier own separate in it. amp. <laughs> and that is, by definition, a separate amp, which is what separates are referring to. So we all have separates because <laughs> the subwoofer legitimately needs a ton of power right. that you right. don't want to have to provide from your AV receiver. True. That's why we buy... Uh, subwoofers with amps in them it used to be and it was not common but there was cases like svs used to offer you know just the sub and no amp and mm -hmm. you could buy the amp separately or you yep. could buy the amp from them yeah she and, did that too for a while yeah, so i mean but you legitimately do not want to drive your subwoofer from your your receiver because <laughs> your receiver doesn't have the power and there you go uh, Infinite Gary, we keep hearing about ATC, ATSC 3.0, and that is needily here. We know that the, the 2020 Summer Olympics will have footage shot and broadcast in 8K in Japan. So Gary is expecting that at least a decent chance, there's at least a decent chance that we'll get some 4K ATSC 3.0 broadcast in North America, and hopefully some TVs with ATSC 3.0 tuners built in to go along with them. Maybe. I mean, I don't know, dude. They do keep it. saying it's coming. I don't know. They seem I, to be a little behind schedule. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not saying it's not possible. And I would, <laughs> I'm just saying that it's, it's, I have a feeling. I, I, okay. My, if I had, if I was a bet man, I had to place a bet on it right now. There's going to be AIDS TV from Sony that does it. Sure. And, that, and that'll be like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that you'll have to buy that TV in order to see the 4k or whatever, or the 8K or whatever. So regardless, the video side of things seem pretty well set, whether it's a TV with an ATSC 3.0 tuner built in or an external box, we'll be getting a 4K broadcast at some point. But what about the audio side of things? Will new AV receivers be needed? Is there an entirely new immersive audio format that will require new audio decoders? He's assuming a TV with an ATSC 3.0 tuner built in will have some way of playing audio with its own built-in speakers. I mean, I don't see why not. Right, yeah. But what about sending the audio out to the AVR? Do we expect an external box might have a better chance of converting the new audio format to our current AV receivers uh, so that our current AV receivers can handle it? Would there be any good reason to buy a new TV with that uh, the new tuner built in? Uh, I mean, it's just metadata, dude. I mean, there's really the, the... If they go for immersive sound, it's just metadata. So unlike other data, other formats that are out there... Uh, 
you know, that have uh, come along where you went from, you know, Dolby Digital and DTS to True HD and Master Audio, you know, which is like a lot more bandwidth and a lot of other stuff. Metadata is not quite the same thing. I feel like that's something that they can just shove onto what they currently have. And we've seen that happen before. Uh Uh-oh, stop. Oh. Uh, where they've added metadata to, you know, a lossy stream mm-hmm. and w- which we get over streaming services right now. And no one had to change the receiver in order. Oh, some of us, some of us did, but well, to get it, to it, actually it, get the newest audio, but you could still play it back on an older receiver yeah. with a legacy format, essentially. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, there, there are actually new uh, audio formats, entirely new codecs for ATSC 3.0. Now, in North America, they've already said they will be using Dolby's AC4. So right okay. now with HDTV broadcast ATSC 1.0, we have Dolby Digital, then that is called AC3 behind the scenes. So this right. is now AC4 audio, and Dolby is touting that it's even more efficient um, that it does have these uh, new abilities that they can't add to AC3 or even AC3E, AC3 Enhanced, which is Dolby Digital Plus. Uh, so this is an entirely new codec that they're talking about with AC4. There's also MPEG-H, which seems to be what uh, most of Asia and Europe is leaning toward, but North America has said we're for sure using AC4, MPEG-H might be optional or something like that. Mm. So. Gary, we know, is in North America. We'll focus on that for the moment because Dolby has already um, sort of talked about this. They have a white paper going all the way back to 2016, actually. Uh, But they specifically have a section in that white paper that is talking about what will you do with a current generation AVR. They're specifically talking about one that can already decode Atmos. Because they're like, if you already have an Atmos AV receiver, there shouldn't be a reason why you have to buy a whole new AV receiver. Now, there is going to need to be an AC4 decoder somewhere in the signal chain that might be built directly into the television. And you just plug your uh, antenna straight into your TV, which has its built-in ATSC 3.0 tuner. And the TV has an AC4 decoder built into it. Or it could be an external box so that you don't have to buy a new television. You have an external box that connects to your antenna. And that has the AC4 decoder in it. And what Dolby's plan is, okay, so you got this AC4 decoder. Like any decoder, it's going to decode the AC4 audio into PCM. And once it is PCM... As long as you put something else inside of that box or something inside of that TV, you can re-encode that PCM into just about anything you want. You're now, right what, back to Atmos again. Yeah. So, I mean, you could put it into a Dolby Digital Plus with Atmos extension, and that's how it comes out. But what they're suggesting is actually leave it as PCM, but do what they call the Dolby MAT format, the MAT, which stands for Metadata Enhanced Audio Transmission. Uh, mm. That's actually what the Apple TV 4K puts out when it's doing Atmos because it is decoding, uh, say, Netflix Atmos audio inside the Apple TV 4K right now, turns it into PCM, but then outputs PCM Dolby Matte metadata enhanced audio transmission. And so it's PCM audio plus metadata. That's what gets sent to your current Atmos AV receiver, and it can decode that. So we are talking about either the TV itself or the box has to have the AC4 decoder in it and this Dolby Matte formatter in it. So it's not a firmware. We can't firmware update our our AV receivers to have this decoder? No, because it is an entirely new decoder. So you need new chips. So there probably will be new AV receivers at some point with AC4 decoders built in. I'm sure they will come up with their own new brand name for it. Maybe, I don't know. Ultra HD audio or something from Dolby, but whatever it's going to be, there probably will be a new brand name for it. That I mean, they love to put new decoders into receivers because it gets you to buy a new new sticker on the front of your receiver. Is absolutely. Uh, But I mean, so will televisions with built-in ATSC 3.0 tuners have AC4 decoders? Yes, they will definitely have AC4 decoders because even to play it out of their own built-in speakers, they'll have to have an AC4 decoder. So that much we're certain of. But will it then have a formatter to output it to your AV receiver? And how would it get there? It would have to get there via uh, eARC. It would have to get there via the enhanced audio return channel because you need that kind of bandwidth for seven channels of PCM plus metadata. So it would have to be eARC. So if your current AV receiver you might have an atmos receiver that doesn't have eARC 
So that much you would have to upgrade if you're using the TV built in. But we don't know for sure that every TV is going to have a Dolby Mat formatter built into it. They right. might choose to just decode it. And then if you're outputting it from the TV, maybe they just run it through a vanilla 5.1 Dolby digital encoder. That would yeah. be the cheapest and easiest thing for them to do and make it highly compatible with just about anything that exists. It, that makes so, the most sense. To be I can see with it. You. So and my then, guess then is that. you would that, just and, use your yeah. surround up mixer to put it over, over your head, right. anyways. So my guess is that an external box probably will be our best chance i'm sure someone will output an atsc 3.0 external tuner box that will output pcm dolby mat somebody will yeah all right brandon two weeks ago brandon mentioned how he's comparing a pair of ascend sierra towers to his golden ear triton 2 towers he's using his Marantz sr7011 receiver to power them sitting 13 feet away and he said that he when he really cranks up the volume both pair of speakers seem to suffer and get shouty Sounds like my kids. So he asked uh, if a if separate amp might help. Rob said it's possible, mm -hmm. but there's no need to go crazy. And then the outlaw, law, dude, I leave for two weeks and everybody's getting the amp suggestions around here. What's going this on with you? This is one of the ones that we were referring to. So this is the same. We haven't gone afield. This is one of the ones. That's what I just said. There were multiple amp suggestions. You said everyone. Said. That's exaggerating. This I don't know. I didn't listen to the podcast. I know. So probably everyone then, because you, you could say anything and I would have to believe it since I didn't mm. listen and I'm not gonna. <laughs> All right. Uh, he said uh, there's no need to go crazy and then the Outlaw Model 5000 would basically have the perfect amount of power for a setup. Brandon is only really concerned uh, with potentially powering his front three speakers with an external amp. He looked up reviews and measurements and noticed that the Outlaw Model 5000 is able to output more power when it's only driving two versus when it's driving all five. Would there also be an increase in, in, in output in driving three versus five? there's more available power. So, yeah. It is a single power supply. Yeah. Uh, so like the measurements that Audioholics did, they looked at what is the maximum power that can come out of one channel, like just right. what it, basically what is the output transistor limit of any of the given channels in this amplifier and what's the maximum that can come out of there. And then how much can it do when it's driving two channels? How much can it do when it's driving all five channels equally? Uh, so yes, there is more wattage available from the shared power supply if you're only driving two instead of five and even more if you're only driving one instead of five. Well when we're listening to actual program content it's exceedingly rare that all five channels are requesting maximum power simultaneously yeah. sounds are typically moving around you're typically getting different sounds out of different speakers and so i mean the short answer is yes three channels will most likely have more power available than five well they will definitely have more powerful right. power available than five but i do it's so rare that it's going to become an issue yeah. where, you know, you're, you, if you had just driven the three, they would have gotten <laughs> the, all the power they asked for. Whereas right, right, right. in a 5.1 setup or a five, five speaker setup, when the three are asking for power and the two surrounds are also asking for power, the two surrounds are not asking for so much power that it is detracting from what the three are getting. Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, I mean the, the auto hollow measurement on that, they're like, yeah, this is one of those amps out there where it, quite easily exceeds its rated power, whether that's sustained into all five channels simultaneously or its peak power that they listed. Like, no, it exceeds it. And that's why I'm like, that is all you need. Uh, mathematically, you could legitimately have a momentary peak that's requesting as much as 400 watts in the speakers that he's using from the distance that he's sitting away. And an AV receiver, the, the one that he has, can't quite get there. It, 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 tops out it was measured by audio Hawks. it tops out at like what was it 320 or 330 watts or something like that yeah. um and of course that's into one speaker and that was with fairly high distortion figures and that might be the shouty little bit screechy type of sound you're starting to get into that i'm requesting this much power and it's really naughty and you're getting some fairly high distortion the outlaw 5000 can do it with a plum and that's why i said it's it's all you need so with a monolith monoprice 3b a better <laughs> choice if you only see this is why we don't recommend amps around I here. I know. Yep. If he only wants to power his front three speakers, what if you were going for a B stock Monolith 3, that would be that much more expensive than the Outlaw <laughs> Model 5000. You see? 
it's a I rabbit know. hole. We it don't sure send is. people it's down so rabbit easy holes. to tumble down. Yeah. No, you don't need it. Okay. And I, I did you guys already dress? Because I didn't listen to the podcast. So did you dress the room? Is he is his room treated in good? Because uh, gosh, now commitment. I can't recall. Although for speakers, it's not super important because we're mostly concerned about the distance and the direct sound. Yeah, but you know the the turning up loud if he's getting reflections around the room. That's could right. Be adding to what he's you know that just it's when we say you know when you turn it up loud and it, it sounds bad we think distortion but it mm -hmm. could be reflections as well so it can if yes. your room is bare and untreated you don't need to be looking at amps first you I'm need to be looking at fairly certain first. brandon mentioned that he does have acoustic yeah. treatments i'm i don't 100 percent on that but uh, i'm fairly certain you don't uh, but need a bigger amp for yeah three channels only regardless the answer be. remains the same you you do not require it now i i mentioned him if i email i say if, if if you're like i'm gonna buy this thing whether you say to or not and i just want justification for it well the the justification i could possibly offer to you is that the monolith 3 does have an even lower noise floor than the outlaw model 5000 He's sitting 13 feet away from this thing how yes, low, low does the noise floor have to be I mean, I it's not like sitting right up on the thing. But I mean, the measurements are there. It has an even lower noise floor. It has an even better signal to noise ratio than the Outlaw 5000. There's no way I can justify it to you in terms of watts because you just do not need... I mean, the Monolith 3 is more powerful, but you just do not need them. But if you need justification, I would I would put it in terms of the signal to noise ratio and the noise floor, which 13 feet away, you also do not need. So uh, no, get the Model 5000. <laughs> it's less expensive. That's the one you need, but... I, I know he's already going to go for the model. Stop saying story, need. So. He doesn't need it. It's the one he wants. I mean, we don't know <laughs> well, that Well, mathematically he needs it. speaking, it gets there. So we have occasionally talked about using six Atmos speakers, top fronts, top rears, and top middles uh, in between. But is there really any benefit? Wouldn't top fronts and top rears create a phantom top middles? Yes. That's the whole point. That's the idea. But, uh, and I from people who have installed stupid numbers of speakers over mm -hmm. their heads, a lot of them agree that, you don't really need all those speakers overhead that there's a law of diminishing returns and it comes after about two but you could <laughs> you could add another pair and have the top middles be their own separate channel um, yeah i think this makes when we start looking at this many speakers over your head you need to start thinking about this less as a um a single row of seats normal home theater right and start thinking about multiple rows and i'm not yeah. talking two i'm talking mm -hmm. more multiple rows of seats very large theaters that's where this sort of stuff the turn offs and stuff like that really start to make sense before that uh it's just sort of overkill and by over yeah. sort of i mean it is 100 percent overkill i mean for the people who've tried it and have said yeah i think six is like optimal even with just one row it's because we don't stereo image very well anywhere right. except for in front of us at about ear level once you start asking us to stereo image front to back or up and down that's just not the way our ears are oriented i mean it's the reason why when you say listen really hard for where something's coming from we naturally cock our head at an angle a bit down into the side we try to get our ears right. separate in all three axes but we don't watch a movie with our head cocked like that so we don't have very good stereo imaging front to back so the the idea that top middles will phantom directly above your head we're not super good at doing that if if our ears were oriented differently on our head we would be better at it but that's just not the way human physiology is so that's the reason some people say if you really want to notice that something is directly above you even if you have top fronts and top rears already they don't really give you that perfect top middle phantom image that's not the speaker's fault that's our head and ears fault right. so they're like yeah if you have physical speakers there you can really get that sense that something is directly above you and then something's above and in front and something's above and behind um i mean that's the reason why if you have four overhead sometimes we say yeah if you're the type of person who really wants to notice it directly overhead maybe go for top middles and front heights instead of top fronts and top rears because then you do have a pair of speakers directly above you and then another pair in front of you you still get some front to back movement but you have those two right above you if you're the type of pe person who wants to really notice it all right but you know it's Atmos. It's kind of pointless. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> Don't really. You're not really getting a whole lot. It's, it's Atmos. It's just another reason to make you buy speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon, what do Max CLL and Max Fall mean? Do these figures attack, uh, affect the HDR10 tone curve that a given display would apply? I don't know what any of that stuff is. All right, so Max CLL so it stands for Maximum Content Light Level. 
So that's okay. the CLL content light level. And max F-A-L-L is maximum frame average light level. So the F-A-L-L is frame average light level. Uh, so this is part of the metadata in an HDR10, or in fact, any HDR signal has this metadata that's into it. Uh, and they also have little bits of metadata that indicate the what uh, mastering display was used. So it'll be like this was a 1,000 nit mastering display or a 4,000 nit mastering display. Right. That information will also be in there. So it tells the, the TV what... Uh what the range is. Yeah, and so it tells the TV that this is correctly. this is the display that was used to master this content. And then, so let's say you used a 4,000 nit mastering display, the Dolby Pulsar, but you mastered it so that the maximum content level, literally the single brightest pixel anywhere in the entire movie, uh, maybe it was 1,300 nits, right? So you never use the full 4,000 nits of the mastering display that you're using, but you went above what a 1,000 nit mastering display could do, and the single brightest pixel in the whole movie hit 1,300 nits, so that would be your max CLL level. Then your maximum frame average light level would be, okay, what is the brightest entire screen? That's what it's talking about, frame average, right? But what's the brightest one? And maybe it's, I don't know, 600 nits or something like that. That could be quite common. So... Would that affect what tone mapping your given display does? Well, it depends because some manufacturers only pay attention to the mastering display metadata. They ignore max CLL and max FALL. They only look at was this a 1000 nit or a 4000 nit mastering display and that's all they use to adjust their tone curve. Others only look at max CLL and nothing else. And some only look at max FALL or nothing else. So it depends is unfortunately the answer. Uh, can't really tell you exactly because even manufacturer from model to model, sometimes they change their mind or model year to model year. Uh, Vincent Tio over at HDTV Test, he's probably the best resource if you want to ask about a specific TV and model because he's the one who measures all this stuff and talks about it. He's like, yeah, from this year to this year, they decided to start looking at Max CLL instead of Mastering Monitor. And he's the one who seems to really be on top of all that stuff. All right, there you go. Yeah. So Brendan is using a JVC RS4, uh, 540, which is the same as the X790 with a 100... <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse Man. me again. <laughs> He's getting there. It's there almost done. All right. There we go. He's got a 106-inch silver ticket screen and an Xbox One X with as his Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Would it be worth his while to buy a Panasonic UB820? I got to go get something to drink. All right. Well, uh, if you heard Richard Gunther's answer from last <laughs> week, he would tell you yes, because he is not a fan of just the, the software and interface in general, the Xbox One X. But in terms of actual, like, the quality of the playback... There's some justification here. I mean, if you're, again, if you're more looking for an excuse and justification, I can perhaps give it to you because JVC has actually worked quite closely with Panasonic in recent times so that if you tell the Panasonic UB820 to use its built-in, um, what do they call it, uh, HDR optimizer, right? Uh, which is essentially doing some tone mapping inside of the UB820 Ultra HD Blu-ray player before it is sent to your display, where it is then tone mapped again. You need to keep that in mind, but it's doing some tone mapping beforehand. Uh, and JVC has basically worked with Panasonic to say, uh, if you tone map everything to one of the settings given, that the JVC will work well with that. Uh, Sony also... Uh, they've set up their projectors to work extremely well with 1,000 nit um, as, as the metadata saying. Either Max CLL or the mastering display is 1,000 nit and the Panasonic can do that. So you can have some justification there, but of course that only applies to discs, right? That is the only thing it applies to is physical discs. So if that's what you watch is 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray discs, uh, then yeah, you can maybe justify it with the 820. It does have that ability to give a... Uh, retone mapped signal to the display that the JVC will then handle really nicely. Yeah, what he said. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm actually having like some PTSD about talking right now. Holy moly. That just like went, I don't know what happened. I, the last little sip of coffee just kind of struck me wrong. Yeah, wrong All right, pipe. I have water now, so we're, we should be good. John on Twitter. John recently replaced his five energy reference connoisseur speakers with MK Sound LCR 950s and SUR. 95 T's. 
I don't know what those are. Oh, Anyways, he's got round some... Round 95 tripoles. You know MK Sound and their tripoles. I do love, love those tripoles. Yeah, so he's got some 4-inch Roxol panels as first reflection points and carpet on the floor. He's powering a system with the Marantz SR6011 and an Outlaw Model 5000 amp. You're going to meet our other friend who <laughs> needs one, I guess, apparently. He's tried listening to his new MK Sound speakers, both with and without Odyssey. He got a headache after 30 minutes or so in either case. He says he likes the added dynamics, but getting these headaches obviously won't do. Is there something that needs to be adjusted or is this just something inherent to MK sound speakers? So he's got first reflection points, but I'm guessing that's it. That's what he described. So because he if he's going to tell us at the first reflection points, he's got something, then he would tell us if he's got other things. I would, would imagine. Think. So uh, what could be causing headaches? When we when the, anytime you think of headaches, you think of one of two things. You think of uh, re basically reflections or uh, around the room where it's it's coming in at you from different angles all at the same time. So your brain's a little confused. So which makes your ears tired, which makes you not your ears, but you know, kind of makes kind of makes your brain get a little Fatigue. fuzzy. Fatigue. Yes. Uh, or you think of distortion. So yes. it's one of those two things. Those are the two things that I think of whenever somebody says, and the same thing with the guy who's complaining about the, the speaker sounding shouty, same mm -hmm. sort of thing. So to me, it's one of it's going to be one of those two things. So if your room is treated or uh, more than what you're saying, then it I would worry about, uh, did he say how far away he's sitting? He did not say that. Uh, I didn't catch that. <clears throat> no, but I mean, these are, so these aren't the top of the line MK sounds. These are the uh, THX select certified ones. Yeah, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm no fan of the tweeter they use at MK sound. It is, it is not an expensive tweeter. It's the reason they actually need three of them stacked on each other to hit THX ultra certification, which by the way, THX ultra isn't that like, massive of a certification they just it's, have to go down to 80 hertz it, it's just a it's just a uh be able to hit reference level down yeah. to 80 hertz and then up to whatever their but at, at a given is. distance and thx ultra is not that large they talk about it in terms of room size and it's like 2500 cubic feet which isn't a gigantic room no. so uh i'm i'm not the biggest fan of that mk sound tweeter this is not mnk mnk is gone miller and chrysal is gone Right, they, the new... that company actually went out of business, right? And yeah. then they sold to somebody yeah. else, sold the name and, to somebody and, else, and now, and now it's, it's MK Sound. You know, the, the designs look similar, and it's got MK stamped. In other words, MK Sound is not M and K. Right. It is a different company. And, I mean, the thing is, he went from Energy Reference Connoisseur, which are really good speakers. My yeah. personal opinion is that this is a downgrade. I don't consider this an upgrade at all at best it's a lateral move and i really don't consider these this series of mk sound speakers to even be a lateral move i would consider them a downgrade from the energy reference connoisseur that that's my opinion which i know nobody wants to hear that if you bought something and were expecting an improvement but uh no that's you not may, where i would point you you know <clears throat> you may have been listening to people on forums who talk about sure. MK as being this, you know, some kind of reference because they're used in a lot of studios. That's true. They are, but uh, so are a lot of crappy speakers for <laughs> reasons. <laughs> but uh, you know, older MK is a completely different animal than the MK sound that exists today. So it may be that you just don't like these speakers, or these speakers mm -hmm. are not fulfilling what you need. In which case, it's return them. Can you return them and go back to what you had before? <laughs> or if yep. you can't, then it's time to start shopping for some new speakers. Yep. Uh, probably. All right, Anthony. Anthony is following up with some uh, more questions about the house he is building from the ground up in the Philippines for his two, row of, uh, two rows of recliners, five seats in each row, plus a counter and bar stools behind the second row. We suggest a room dimensions of 27 by 19, but with a 12-foot ceiling height. Uh, he will have throughout the house. He does plan to have an acoustically transparent screen with a false wall, and his front row of seats will be his primary row. He was planning on three feet of space behind the false wall. Is 27 feet still long enough for the room? Because I mentioned in passing two feet as the false wall, just as <clears throat> he's like, for the plans he has, he wants three feet of space behind that false wall. Yeah, so does he need to increase the room dimensions? I don't think so. Uh, no, I mean, so I was going by six feet from the back wall to the bar stools basically right which should be sufficient and then the you know second row of recliners shrinks back your screen size that's all it does is make yeah well it just moves smaller. you a foot forward it moves you to a 12 foot viewing distance from the front row to the screen instead of a 13 foot viewing distance from the front row but to the screen from acoustically from 
the mm-hmm. front, uh, front where you're sitting in the room uh, for acoustics purposes has not changed. Nope, You've just moved that false. You can move that false wall like smack dab <laughs> in the middle of the room if you really right. want to. You're just now you have to, you need a you know 65 inch you know <laughs> projection screen and something that can hit that from you know six feet away or whatever. Yeah. that doesn't matter. You know, so no, I mean to me a 12 foot viewing distance from your primary front row to the screen is perfectly reasonable. And given yeah. what he's going to say next about screen size and what kind of viewing distance uh, or uh, field of view that he'd like to attain, uh, I think that's actually going to work out swimmingly. So I wouldn't change the dimensions. So he says he prefers a large field of view. He was thinking of a screen size in the range of 140 to 150. What do what distance should his distance be from ISO screen end up being? Well, I don't know what a large field of view means exactly. I know. Exactly. That's tough Can't, to say. I'm, I'm gotta... In my head, that's larger than a 45 degree field of view because that's what I consider really nice for me. That's that what I want. that doesn't mean anything. He could normally sit in the back I of a movie theater and say, well, this has got to be bigger. You know, uh, right. so, but the, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is most projectors have a hard time uh getting really bright and good images yes. at, at larger than 135 inch diagonal right right so if you you know first of all we've said it about a bajillion times but let me say it again go to the movie theaters sit where you want to sit for your large field of view count yep. the ceiling tiles uh from where you're sitting to the f- screen and then count when some movie starts and you can see the width of the screen count the sc- the ceiling tiles across that and then that's what field of view you like yeah. and then we can you know we that ratio then we can tell you what exactly it is but i don't think you should go bigger than 135 inches for projector considerations and then you can just move the wall front to back <laughs> you know or right. more forward <laughs> if you want it to be a larger field of view because again acoustically it doesn't matter right uh for it, it, you're just now moving that's one of the advantages of having an acoustically transparent screen in the oh, false yes. wall up front is you can put everything behind the front false wall you can't see anything it looks really clean and then if you're like i own i have a projector that can do this you know where you know and i want this field of view well just move your false wall forward by you know a foot or right. whatever so, I mean, I will say this actually might work out perfectly well because if you do stick with the 135-inch screen size and now you're 12 feet away instead of 13 feet away, that is a 45-degree field of view, which is exactly which, what I would want. I consider that a large field of view. That's what I want for CinemaScope is 45-degree field of view, but some people want even larger. If you did go with the 150-inch size from 12 feet away, now that's getting you a slightly more than a 50 degree field of view. For me, that's too big. I have to yeah. start moving my eyes and my head to actually see the sides of the screen. But some people really like that. But the point is, you wouldn't need to go any larger than 150. To me, that's the cutoff point for anything I would consider a, a normal home projector. It's not quite bright enough to really give you uh, a, a full HDR effect at 150. 135 is is like the cutoff. I for would a put decent 135 and then move yeah. the screen forward. And then move the screen a little forward if it's not big enough for you. I can, uh, I can get behind that for sure. Yeah. Uh, we, we agree that a 7.4.6 configuration using multiple side uh, surround speakers. How many side surround speakers for e- on each side do we think he should have, and how should he wire them to his AV receiver? Uh, two. One for each row of seats, because two rows of seats, right? The yeah, two rows stools, of seats plus the bar stools. But, uh, I mean, I, I would have, yeah, I would have two side surround speakers on each side wall, so four side surround speakers total, and I would have them just slightly behind the front row of recliners and just slightly behind the back row of recliners, which will actually probably put them directly to the sides of the bar stools, this and I, I wouldn't have a third side surround speaker just for the bar stool row. That no. No. Two on each side would be fine. You're going to wire them in series, so it's going to yeah. be red. So red to your first surround speaker, and then the black out from your first surround speaker to the red of the second surround second speaker, surround speaker and then the black of the second surround speaker back to the black of the AV receiver on, that's right on the one side and then you can do the same thing on the other side yep that's all you'd have to do and uh yeah you, you wouldn't even really have to worry about it with i'm going to be recommending some pretty efficient speakers when we get to that part of things okay. uh so do we re- do we um agree with 7.4.6 i mean this is a large room and he's got the space to plan this out so should he go 7.4 or 0.6 or something else? I don't like it. <laughs> you'd, you'd stop at 7.2.4? Uh, well, yeah, 7.2.4, yeah. I would. And the reason is, is you can put the 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 top fronts and the top rears 
mm-hmm. in front of your front seats and behind your back seats, but you know, sort of close to those seats. And it gives you that whole thing. Unless you, you really think that you only care about that first row of seats, front in row. which case mm. you could put top middles above that and mm-hmm. then you know, then the top rears behind the back seats and the top fronts way in the front. Yeah. You know. I mean, what I would maybe say to you is I have zero problem with you pre-wiring for the six overheads because yeah. why the heck not? Well, this room is under construction. By all means, run the speaker wire. But I wouldn't necessarily have it in mind that I must have six overheads. I would probably pre-wire it, but then try just top fronts, top rears. And if you're like, I would like to have this third pair of overhead speakers. Okay. Okay. At right. that point, you've already pre-wired That's for fine. it. It's not a big deal. Um, I mean... I, I'm all for four subwoofers if you can afford it. You know, one in each corner. Why the heck not? <laughs> it's it'll be you got three rows of seats and wide seating area. That'll be as uniform as you can possibly get it. So to me, that's just a budgetary thing because I I certainly have nothing against four subs. It's not necessarily needed if the budget has to be spent elsewhere. Okay, certainly have at least two though. Twenty-seven by nineteen by twelve. Okay, it's a big room. It's a big room. He's got a budget of twenty grand to cover all of the speakers, subwoofers, and a projector, although he already owns one pair of SVS PB12 Plus subs, which he could either use or sell. Before digging into gear options, the Philippines uses 220-volt outlets. Will it even be possible to use his PB12 Plus subs? Would it be safe to connect them to a voltage transformer? Most subwoofers are that are amplifiers, and you'll have to look on the back here. There's a switch that you can switch from uh, 120 to 220 or whatever it is, or 60 or 50 or whatever. I, I did come across a mention, though, and it actually was for... Because this is the PB12+, Plus, not the right. uh, what P, PB3000 series that we oh. will be up to now. Is that yeah, 12 plus? Because the, the, the 3000s replaced the pluses. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, but it, it, I did see mention that... Um, Somebody was asking a very similar question, moving someplace that's 240 volt service. And SVS said they will actually just swap the amplifier. Oh, uh, so they'll give you a 240 volt amplifier instead of your current 120 volt amplifier and to just do things that way. So it seems entirely possible. They definitely do sell their subs all over the world and they'll they'll give you or, you know, they'll ha- have the hardware option of swapping out for the proper amplifier. Um, are they large enough for this room size? I mean, I mean yes, it's right there. It's, it's on the, the borderline, yeah. but yes. Well, and if, you if, if they four replace of them if, in each if the three thousands replace these, this yeah. in you and you said I was going to buy a you know PP three thousand or whatever it's called uh, right. for this room, I'd be like, yeah, okay, that's mm-hmm. a, you could not get away with the two thousand. Two thousand no. is not big enough for this room. Uh, a four thousand would be would crush it. Would, right, because be I mean we're talking six thousand cubic feet. Yeah, it's a big room. It's a big but room. I think that this is I think. This is, especially if you're thinking about getting two additional subs mm-hmm. to go in here, uh, I think that you're, you're, you would be fine with these, uh, or, and then two more 3,000s, basically. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, well, we'll get to it when he's talking about what to actually buy, so there. Yeah, coming up. So which, which speaker subs and projector would we suggest for the setup? One thing to be aware of that he wants to, all of his surround and surround back speakers to be on walls because most walls in the Philippines are constructed using hollow block and or cement, making in-wall speakers impossible. He'd like an in-ceiling speakers for Atmos, though. So is he buying all this gear before he leaves for the I Philippines? I think he's just, he's just enjoying planning. I believe that's really the case is that he's enjoying planning all of this. That's but fun. yes, he, he probably I will get behind purchase that things yeah, before he goes because more stuff available in the United States, right? That's true. And the shipping has got to be... Right. I mean, if, he, if he's got a... Especially if he's moving out there and he's got a company that's moving him out there, then it's going to be cheaper just to shove it on the... Shove it in the container with everything else and then it's going to be to uh, actually ship it. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see here. So he wants on wall speakers, uh, yeah, for, for at least surrounds. The, for the surrounds and the surround backs. That's right. So who makes good on walls? Uh, and he needs, some... he needs something that can play pretty darn loud. Cause I'm in 19 foot wide room and his surround back speakers are going to be a good distance behind him with a 27 foot long yeah. room. Right. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> geez. I almost want to say, you know, something horn-loaded, but I really yeah. don't. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I'm ju- I'll jump in here and say that I actually think if you so if you were to say sell your PB12 pluses because um, maybe you don't want to deal with a conversion or you just want something that's even a bit higher output and will fit within this. So I'm going to talk about Power Sound Audio again because actually Power Sound Audio right on their website, they say all of our subwoofers, the amplifiers we use are universal power supply. Plug it into 120, plug it into 240. They don't care. They're already ready to go with either voltage. So that's one thing that makes it easy. And actually I can go right back to that V1510 that we already talked about earlier, which has the output level. It's a little bit more than your PP12 Plus. It's right about even with the current 3000 series. And that would be reasonable. Four of those you could get V1510s from Power Sound Audio and it will already work. But their speakers, because Power Sound Audio does sell speakers and they use a compression tweeter in there. And aside from the very capable front speakers that you could get from them, they do also have speakers that are completely designed to be mounted on your walls as surround speakers, still with a compression tweeter in them and a little bit of a wedge design. They look very reminiscent of what you would find in a full-size commercial movie theater. So he's talking about having two side surround speakers uh, on each side wall, plus two surround back, so six there, plus another three up front of the, uh, the main speakers. If you got that with four of the V1510 subwoofers, all of that together, nine speakers, four subwoofers, subwoofers from Power Sound Audio, shipping included, would be $10,000. $1,575. I mean, that's a pretty penny, but this is the type of efficiency and output capability in these speakers that you actually wouldn't even need a separate amp for these. <laughs> these, even in your room size, can be quite easily powered to full reference volume with 100 watts. Mm. Like, quite easily. So that's one reason why I like them, because I could point you to some of my other favorites, like Ascend Acoustics would be something that I might be able to point you to. And even though they look smaller and they're not as efficient, they have enough power handling that they could do it, but you would for sure need external amplification. Now you'd need that maybe full 400 watts that they actually can absorb in the Ascend Acoustics, but you're not going to get that from a Navy receiver. Whereas the Power Sound Audios, you don't even need an external amp. They're so efficient. Mm. And then on top of that, you got this 12 foot ceiling. I'd point you to some Klipsch in ceilings because Power Sound Audio doesn't make in ceiling speakers. But I point you to some Klipsch in ceilings. Again, nice and efficient. You can get six of them if you want to go six right away for about $1,500 for ones that would match the type of output as the Power Sound Audios. So he gave some in his email figures he's like this is the kind of budget i have for speakers the budget i have for subs the budget i have for my projector but i'm like no put it all together into one pot and spend appropriately don't think i have to limit myself to this but because he he budgeted like ten thousand dollars for subs leaving himself only four thousand dollars for their projector and i'm like no nah, i want you to spend like six to eight grand on your projector and maybe save a little bit of money on the speakers you know so what on walls did you suggest the on walls or the power sound audios the uh they're a little bit of a wh- one yeah. one ten 110 110s. surround 110 s's yeah so it's, it looks a lot like the the what you call it okay. what like prime elevations a the little bit yeah. except that these are considerably wider and bigger than prime elevations are they okay. oh yeah that's like mm-hmm. an eight inch woofer in there and then a compression tweeter where's the specs on this thing uh you go to like the components of the performance in there but uh i mean that's that's kind of where I'm looking. I mean, you, you could certainly look at, um, like, if, if you had a combination of Ascend Acoustics and Aperion, go go Aperion for the in ceilings, because uh, they would play very nicely with the Ascend Acoustic speakers. But all of those, they'd be capable, but you'd need the external amplification. So he also asked what projector he'd like to get in here. And I'm like, get a JVC and go for one of their genuine 4K models. I see no reason not to. Um, you know, you could go for the NX5. That's a $6,000 genuine 4K projector. It does have just enough lumens. I mean, it'll have, it has certainly has enough lumens to light up your 135 inch screen. If you go with that, just enough to light up your 150, but maybe not for full HDR impact, but you actually have the budget. You might be able to sp- go all the way up to the NX7, which would be tremendous. So instead of limiting your projector budget to only $4,000, I'm like, nah, get, get yourself a JVC and get a genuine 4K. There's no reason not to. All right, so I'm going to recommend the SV661W or WR, depending on how much money you want to spend. Uh, RBH? On walls, the RBHs. Those okay. are 90 watts efficient. So yours is okay. 94? Yeah. These are 90. So, okay. and, and they have two different uh, models. They have the W and the WR. The W is more expensive than what they're $900 each. Yours are okay. 650 or something yeah. like that, right? Is that right? 650? Something like that. Uh, something in that range. Yeah. Six, seven, 675. So, okay. Close. So 
They're uh, they're a little bit more expensive, one hundred twenty five dollars more. Mm-hmm. They're MTM design, uh, so you know, mid range tweeter, mid range. They can play down to fifty five hertz, uh, so you, you plenty of you know, extension down to eighty hertz. You can put them all the way around you, uh, and then you've got the option of going for the R version, which is the reference or whatever the R mm-hmm. stands for, which has a uh, uh, planer tweeter in there. Oh, okay. Rather than the the silk. It's got the folded there. ribbon tweeter in the R yeah. version. The These also come version. in white. If you're caring mm. about caring about well, that, certainly not behind his projection screen. He's but, not going to uh, care uh, about on the that. Walls, perhaps. But, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I can dig that RBH for sure. Yeah. I can dig that. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to recommend for speakers. Everything else I wasn't listening to, but the projector, what Rob said, was fine. Uh, that's a yeah. So I mean, if that. you spent more on the RBH speakers, then maybe you just keep the subs you already have, and yeah. that's how you that's how you get your budget back in line without having to downgrade on the projector. Yeah, I would not downgrade on the projector. I agree. With no, you that. not for this. That yeah. that's this is a this is like a master plan that you're going from the ground up. Of like, I, this is not time to skimp on the projector. And then quite literally. Any in ceiling speakers will be fine. Though RBH does make RBH makes yeah makes lots of in ceiling speakers you could choose from. So yep. I don't know if they have six of them for fifteen hundred bucks, but you know whatever. So is there any receiver besides a Denon X eighty five hundred H to even consider? Yeah, the turn off. <laughs> consider that you can't afford it, but <laughs> Not you can even you close consider to it. The price. <laughs> <laughs> That's the consideration. That's the only other one that can do six overheads. If you're really, but if you're not dedicated to the whole six overhead thing, then right. Then and that's, you've got that's lots of where, options. That's where I really think, because I mean, not only that, you could actually go for, let's say you're still planning to not have any external amps, so you go for the 6500H or the sure. forthcoming 6600H. By the time he's actually ready to buy, we'll probably be up to the 67 or 68, because this might be <laughs> two years in the future. But you look at that 6000 series, has 11 amplifiers built into it. So it can power a full 7.1.4 configuration all by itself. Still don't right. need external amps. You could go for that, which is like half the price of the 8500H. And if you decide in the future you really want those six overheads, you had, I know it's crazy, but you add two more receivers to your setup to matrix out the top middle. I mean, that, it would still be considerably cheaper than the X8500H is what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. Uh, going back to, I think, start with the four and see if that'll work for you. Yeah. Jay. Jay is hoping to put together a 3.1 sound system for his mother. She has some hearing loss, so maximum clarity, especially for a dialogue and voices, is the goal. She also wants it to be visually unobtrusive. How does she feel about lamps? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that'll match up on the sound quality side of things, though. Any speakers will be mounted beside or below her TV. The room is roughly 10 by 20 by 7 and a half. There's a thick carpeting and drapes. Jay wouldn't expect any further changes to the acoustics. Well, therein lies your problem, but go mm. on. He came across the Canton on-wall speakers, which he thought looked nice with their white finish and their price of $400 a pair is about right. But he doesn't really know anything else about them. So what might we recommend? Uh, I would recommend you figuring out a way to put some acoustic treatments behind this woman's head. That's the f- 100% the first thing I would do. I'm be- I'm betting she's sitting in the ten foot dimension as the front to back and right. has the seat right against, against the back the wall because yeah. most people do. That's the same problem I have with my parents, and yeah. they sit on the back wall. Their speakers are not optimally placed, yeah, and they're dealing with you know I we we can't hear the we can't understand the dialogue, so we have the closed captioning on all the time. Yeah, so the hundred the first thing you have to do is figure out a way to get some room treatments something behind her head to counts uh, to counteract that even if that it's bounce. more drapes i mean something if you can get some thick heavy just drapes, put something behind a... the freaking drapes that's what i say you ton. know if there's yeah. drapes back there just put something back there so that you know it a catches freestanding it. panel yeah. yeah uh that's the number one thing you can do and then i think the cantons are probably fine i've been hit or miss with cantons as far as my experience was with them uh some of them have been really good some of them have been you know a little shrill but uh it it depends on which which model you're getting uh if you think they look nice that's fine Uh, i would also suggest something like a a, a, a yamaha soundbar you know one of their sound projectors but that's going to be those 14 400 dollars a pair yeah, pair. yeah, you're gonna have a hard time getting a good uh, pan, uh, Yamaha soundbar for 400 bucks. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 
I'm okay with this. I'm also okay. There's Kef options that are out there. Yes. Uh, and actually, I, I want to point you, uh, again, Richard Gunther last week, uh, this is what I recommended to him, because it was a similar situation. They wanted something very unobtrusive, but still very good sounding. And the HTF8003, uh, I mean, it looks like a sound bar, but this is actually just three passive speakers inside of one case. It has speaker binding posts on the back. You still connect it to a traditional AV receiver. Uh, but I mean, this is an excellent sounding speaker bar that I will heartily recommend. And to get the price where you want it, they sell it at Accessories for Less uh, for $550 right now. Normally goes for $800, which would probably be a bit too expensive. Uh, but $550 bucks for the HTF8003. Uh, I mean, if you want to go directly from KEF and not go Accessories for Less, uh, there is the smaller HTF F7003, but that thing will, I mean, they claim it plays down to 120 hertz. It's really about 200. I mean, that's, it's a much smaller unit with only two inch drivers. Right. Uh, plus tweeters. So that but HTF. But if Dialog's uh, all you really care about, then, you know, this KEF would be a good option. For oh, you. yeah, because it actually has a dedicated center that's in yeah. there that you can adjust independent. So I really like that as the solution here, to be honest. Now, you could also consider going sound bar. Uh, if you did, I'd want you to get one that genuinely has a center speaker transducer, not one of the ones that's, you know, most, a lot of them are two channel and they just give you the phantom center. And given that little bit of hearing loss here, you want to be able to boost that dialogue. So I can stand behind Sony's um, HTZ9F. Yeah. That sound bar, it, you know, it does have the dedicated middle uh, speaker in there. And it comes with the wireless subwoofer, of course, as well. And you can find it for right about $700. But don't forget, that includes the wireless sub. So it's not like you're getting nothing for the extra money there. you got to say sub in air quotes because it's I not. Suppose, well, base yeah, module. Base it module. has a base module. Yeah. For Once you start getting up to that price point, seven, eight, nine hundred bucks, though, you, right. start, you, you start to... St- looking at those dent those yamahas i was saying the sound projectors those start oh. coming in there i mean i really yeah. like the the kef as the solution that's yeah. that's the one i kind of want you to accessories get. for less that makes a lot more sense yeah graham whenever graham examines the frequency response graphs of various bookshelf speakers and they're supposedly matching center speaker models it seems to be a constant trait that the center speaker is not as good i don't know how you can see that from the graphs but let's go more wiggly center- i guess i guess why are center speakers like this and should he just get a third bookshelf speaker to use as a center instead well let's answer the second question first mm-hmm. if you can yes yep that was the original idea the original idea of th- uh, was three speakers up front three identical vertical speakers up front that was the original idea it's just I people can... quickly realized wait where does my tv go yeah i can pl- <laughs> i completely disagree that you can look at a, a graph and say that a, a speaker is better or worse than another <laughs> speaker because if that were the case we would never do listening tests because believe but maybe me, he just means they don't look identical or the center never looks quite as linear or something like that that might be true but uh, right. i i you can't look at a graph and know that so i have met some very very capable center speakers in fact mm-hmm. many co- companies just they sell an lcr which is a left sure right or you lay it on that side and spin the tweeter sometimes mm-hmm. center you know and there's nothing wrong with that speaker that's a good solution for this but when you lay it on that side it is going to sound different or at least it's going to measure slightly different than what it measures when it's vertical it's just the way yeah. things work i mean it's the reason why our favorite center speakers have a tweeter and mid-range driver vertically stacked in the middle right. and then maybe flanked by a couple of woofers on either side right. as opposed to the very traditional woofer tweeter woofer which should be vertical in a dapolito array but they just often turn that horizontal and now you have a woofer beside a tweeter beside another woofer and that does cause comb filtering issues and some lobing from side to side uh you know and maybe those are the measurements he's looking at maybe he's looking at lobing measurements or something yeah, like maybe. that uh, but a lot of that can be mitigated by the design that we prefer, which is either a vertically aligned with the tweeter above a mid-range driver and then maybe flanked by woofers, or it could be concentric, you know, like what Kef does. Uh, we have the tweeter right embedded in the middle of a midwoofer, or it could just be offset with the tweeter raised above the woofers so that you're not getting the directly horizontal comb filtering effects. Mm. All right, Monty. Monty just moved into his new house. It already has a whole house audio system installed. I'm sure it's fantastic, too. There's a 12-zone Phoenix Gold distribution amp, and each room has a volume control knob on the wall. Sounds pretty awesome. To input sound into the distribution app, there are speaker wires that run to the living room where the TV is installed. There's speaker wires to go to the amp. Yep. 
So it's a speaker wire connection, not a line level connection. That's what feeds into the distribution app. Well, I'm not sure why. Why? But that is that is the <laughs> way is of that things. Even, what amp does that? I what some amp does that. Some do. This one does apparently. This one does. Uh, he currently owns a Moran Slimline NR sixteen oh eight receiver, and he can assign its surround back height uh, speaker binding post to Zone two outputs, but it will only send two channel analog inputs to Zone two. Obviously, no digital sources of any kind. And furthermore, he would like to have Atmos in the living room, as it already has four in ceiling speakers and the appropriate positions. He would like to have five point one point four in the living room, plus be able to feed Zone two. I kind of lost the track with that one, but we'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah. He likes Morans and would prefer to stick with them. Is there a receiver model that can do 5.1.4 in the main room while passing digital audio so, uh, sources to a pair of Zone 2 binding posts? No, Nobody can do that. Yeah, you can. You that's can pass a digital... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Digital audio source. Okay, yes. You can yeah. pass a digital... It's still going to be two-channel. It's still going to be two-channel, but yeah. it could be two-channel digital audio source being in. So the newer, it as a... higher-level Marantzis should be able to do that, no problem, right? Well, only one. The really? 80, the 8012 is the only one that can do it because even though they have other models that can process 11 speakers and could do this if you were using the zone two pre-outs plus right. powering 5.1.4 itself in the main zone in order to use zone two binding posts in addition to playing 5.1.4 in the main room it has to be one that actually has 11 amps built in yes. and the only one in Marantz's lineup is the sr8012 now that would make me say to you, because of how expensive that model is, uh, go to the sister company of Denon. I know the exterior aesthetics might not look quite as nice, but you can get the 640, uh, uh, 6400H or the 6500H for a considerably lower price than the Marantz 8012, and that also has 11 amps built in and can do this. So he says, would it be easier just to have a second AV receiver that does nothing but feed the distribution amp? Yup. I mean, yeah. Compared yes. to if you're gonna stick with Morantz, then yes. And not sure. only that, you could still use your main Atmos receiver to feed the second receiver via its Zone Two preouts. Yeah. Instead, so you so if you're worried about oh the sources I have plugged into my Atmos receiver, maybe I want to distribute those. His you can still do, do that. Atmos though, does it? Well, I mean, Is there it? are slim lines that do five point one point two. Right. Right. But nothing he, that does five point one point four. So you could keep your slimline to pa to do the distribution amp. Oh, as the distribution amp, yeah, for sure. Because and then buy since, a new receiver for your main zone. Since his distribution amp is an amp, you don't need a lot of wattage coming out of the AV receiver that's feeding it. You just need something that'll send out a speaker level signal. So yeah, that's keep your so slimline. That's so goofy. Why that's do they do two. that? Why don't I they just? Don't know. First of all, why did anybody make this stupid thing? And second, why did, why did they install it here? It's just, I swear they do it just to mess with people. So he has a Harmony remote. How easy will it be to control both the main room and Zone 2 using the Harmony? If you get two separate receivers... <laughs> receivers? Very that are easy. Both, well, <laughs> that are both Marantz, though. But you can still use the Harmony hub with its um, precision IR so that, that it's only sending where, commands. That's yeah. where it would end up becoming... Sure. Uh, not an issue, but something that you would have to think about. If you got two different brands, then it's as mm. easy as saying... The main zone is a Denon, and the distribution amp is a Marantz, and sure, blah. I'm well, done. I don't know. Denon and Marantz might share commands. You don't. You uh, make a good point. That is true. They, I, uh, think they, I think they very well. If it was a Yamaha and your Marantz, or an Onkyo and your Marantz, or, or something Pioneer, like that, right? Yes. Yeah. So but you, but regard even if you had two Marantzes, which we know would share remote commands, you can still do this with your Harmony Hub because it does have that little precision IR output, and right. then you can tell it the ones using the precision IR only controls this one AV receiver, and your Harmony Hub can totally do that. So actually, even more reason to go with the two receiver solution. Yeah. So he's considered using Raspberry Pi to run Cody. He'd like to be able to control his digital music collection from his phone. Any thoughts? Yeah, I don't know how to make that work going. I mean, there are a gazillion ways to kind of do what you want to do. I mean, you, you could. If you're just like, this is what I want to do as a project, okay. It'll do it. Great. Uh, Raspberry but you Pi could... will do just about anything if you, know what, <laughs> if you know what you're doing. I mean, it's just basically a processor and you know whatever sure. else you have in there. So Raspberry Pi can do almost anything the question is how much of it do you want to do yourself 
Right. And how much do you want to have to fiddle with the dang thing? Because it's just going to be one of your sources that's plugged into your AV receiver that's now feeding your distribution app. So any number of things could do. I mean, you could if you're using Apple products as your phones, you could do this directly with AirPlay without sure. needing to do anything else. Or if you're on Android, you could do this through a Chromecast. You know, without anything else, so right it until isn't they necess- stop supporting Chromecast for so many right. Real- <laughs> but it isn't necessary to necessary to do this with a Raspberry Pi and Cody. I mean, you could do something in Plex. You could do this directly through HEOS because you could have a hard drive plugged into the USB input of your new AV receiver, and that'll stream directly off of that, and you can send it to any HEOS um, device, which your Smarant Slimline probably already is. So there are a multitude of ways to do this without necessarily buying anything else. But if what you want I would to do check is that Morant's thing that he just said about he is. <laughs> yeah, because the older I would ones wouldn't have it. I, before. I don't know how I don't know how old your slimline is. Yeah. The new ones have it built in. The older ones don't. So he's got a separate room that he plans to turn into a dedicated theater. It's 19 by 17 and a half by 9, so roughly 3,000 cubic feet. He already owns a PC, a SVS PC2000 sub. He plans to have dual subwoofers for this dedicated theater. Is the PC2000 sufficient for this room size? Can he just buy a second PC2000, or should he sell the one he has and put the funds towards a higher a pair of higher output subs? Again, this is like right there. I think that the PC2000 th- is... 3,000 be- cubic feet. That. Yeah. That's doable for yeah. a 2000 series, ported 2000 series. I, I, I feel, I feel, this is this is a you have a good subwoofer for your space. Yeah, this was. Oh yeah, not overkill. I, but. I don't see any. I grab a second PC 2000. I think you're laughing in 3000 cubic feet. That's yeah. that's sufficient. All right, let's do. I don't know, one, maybe two more. Let's see what we can get in here. Michael uh, from Facebook. Michael picked up an Onkyo TXN uh, NR686 from Gibby's. So he's in Canada. Mm-hmm. For the most part, set up with smoothly, but when he uh, tries to use his Bell TV satellite box, a message pops up on the screen saying, can I play this content? His NVIDIA Shield plays without any problems, and he tried outputting from the Onkyo to three different TVs, a Philips, a 32-inch Philips from 2011, a 32-inch RCA from three or four years ago, and a 20-inch Sharp. Got a bunch of small TVs just lying around. Michael is visually impaired, so he's relying on his wife's help to set things up. He says the Bell TV box has 4K printed on it. Please tell him he doesn't need a new TV on top of all of this. <laughs> uh, this doesn't sound like a new TV issue. This sounds like a resolution issue or it a is. format issue. Well, like, like resolution sort of- plus HDCP, unfortunately. Okay, well, that makes sense. So uh, this, unfortunately, is a bit of a known issue with uh, Eris, which is what took over Motorola-branded uh, cable and satellite TV boxes. Uh, the, okay. the 4K, which he says his is, uh, Eris boxes, which is what Bell uses. Um, and this goes all the way back to 2016, and they have said there should be a fix coming, and, well, we're still waiting. Um <laughs> Unfortunately, when the box, the the cable, the bell box is plugged into a device like your new 686 that handles HDCP 2.2, it says, well, that's what we're using. It doesn't seem to have the ability to look farther down the signal chain and say, well, at the other end of this is a TV that is only HDMI or HDCP 1.4, which these televisions all sound like TVs that would definitely not be HDCP 2.2. None of these are 4K TVs. Um, And so unfortunately, it sends out an HDCP 2.2 handshake to the AV receiver, which the AV receiver can handle. But then the AV receiver says, I'm connected to a non-HDCP 2.2 television, so I can't pass along this content. And there doesn't seem to be a fix. The only solution right now is you plug your bell box directly into one of your t one of the HDMI inputs on your television. It will work with that because it's not connected to any HDCP 2.2 device in between. And then you use ARC. And then you use ARC or an optical. Uh, uh, you know, audio cable to feed the audio back to your AV receiver. Unfortunately, it's the only solution. Hmm. Uh, it's not the only solution. I mean, you could use a, one of those boxes. Those one of the HD boxes Fury. that converts yeah. HDCP 2.2 to HDCP 1.4. Yes, you could do that. But, uh, Monoprice sells them as well, yeah. uh, HDCP converters. So yeah, yeah, you could use that. So how does he manually adjust the EQ settings on the Onkyo 686? He'd like a little bit more trouble. Onkyo is one of the few receivers that they tend to have tone controls, don't they? I mean... Oh, almost everybody still has tone controls. There's I just don't. treble and bass. I don't just know treble and I don't remember the last time I saw a tone control on a receiver. So oh, they're we, in there. I would have to go looking for them, I guess. 
Um, yeah, well, a couple ways to do it. So direct directly, if what you really want to do is adjust the EQ, and you can. Um, so there's the the little gear icon. So right where your left, right, up, down arrows are with enter in the middle, to the bottom left of that, there's a little teeny tiny gear icon, and that's what brings up your setup menu. Mm. So uh, from there, you'd select number two, which is labeled speakers. And then under speakers, you'd select six, which is called equalizer settings. And from there, you choose which pair of speakers you want to re-equalize, you know, your fronts, your centers, your surround. And then you use left and right to choose a frequency, and they're preset. You only have a selection of nine frequencies. You don't get to, you know, randomly choose whatever frequency mm. you want. Uh, and then use up and down to boost or cut that given frequency. That's not like, that's not like a tone control, though. I mean, no, it no, is. That, that's, an equal, that's a graphic equalizer. That's yeah, what that graphic is. Equalizer. Graphic. So they do also have a traditional tone control. Uh, there is a quick menu button on the Onkyos. It's to the upper left of your up, down, left, right arrows and the enter key in the middle. Upper left, there's a Q button. All it says is Q on it. Brings up your quick menu. Uh, one of the options, the first one is tone controls, treble and bass. Boost yeah, and cut your treble and bass. That's what I would do if I were him. That's it. Oh yeah, I would start with the tone control and just boost your treble a little bit. Yeah. All right, Jonathan. Jonathan started looking into the topic of room acoustics as we discussed his theater, uh, the C-Din <laughs> He's intercapped it now. He even intercapped it in his email. C He's like, it's the C Den. Because he's a Seattle Seahawks, Seattle Seahawks fan. fan. That's right. <sighs> Anyways, he's feeling a little overwhelmed. <laughs> there is a book, or is there a book, a guide, or a course that we recommend so that he will, he will he'll feel like a he truly understands what all the graphs and measurements are showing. He's reading about auto calibration, room EQ wizard, mini DSP, sound waves, phase, acoustic treatments, and so on. Certainly seems like a rabbit hole. So before he's led astray, what's a good resource for getting a firm grasp and understanding uh, of the basics? So there's the the uh, what's his name's book, the Master Acoustics, whatever it is. It's the big one. <laughs> so uh, that would be Floyd Tools. Or, yeah. Are you talking about Floyd Tools? Yeah. So it's 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 called Sound Reproduction: yeah. The Acoustics and Psychoacoustics of Loudspeakers and Rooms. That so, will probably not help you. Because <laughs> you well, I mean, it will if you can re, if you can digest it. It's like a textbook. I mean, it's, does it, it is. it doesn't. It is. It's a textbook. Like but it. I mean, they, they start with the basics. He yeah. starts with the basics in that. But maybe you don't get past the first five chapters. Yeah. Maybe that's the case because yeah. it does. Get, it, get, it, gets it gets into heady. this stuff. Uh, they're up to their third edition now. But absolutely, I mean, it's Floyd. I mean, when they say Floyd Tool wrote the book on acoustics. This is the book they're talking about, yeah. Sound Reproduction. Um, I would also point you to the Master Handbook of Acoustics. Uh, okay. That is another one that you could look at. Um, that's but, by I mean, there's so many online... I mean, you could go to Audioholics, or we have they have plenty of articles over there. Git sure. Acoustics is going to have tons. Yeah, I Git Acoustics, I was going to mention their articles. Uh, yeah. What's his name? Oh, the Weiner guy. Anything that he writes, if it's got his name on it, I would not read it. I mean, you could read it, but I would... <laughs> I mean, his information is good. We just, we, for other very different reasons, don't recommend. Various sundry reasons. <laughs> oh, I mean, people I, are going to be asking. Most people have never heard of, oh, God, I don't want to get into that can of worms. But, oh, I mean, it, 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 most of the times what he's saying is, okay, it's just, it's like he has good information. And then, and because of that, you should floor the ceiling everything. <laughs> okay, wait a second. Right. <laughs> Wait, hey, you made a little bit of a logical leap there. That I, I missed a couple of steps in between. Oh, it's because you want to make a bunch of money. Got it. Okay. But I mean, when when Jonathan is saying, is there is there like one place he can go to? Sound reproduction by Floyd Tool, Master Handbook of Acoustics. Th those are two easy resources. They're just books. You can read them at your leisure. Uh, you could also. This isn't about room acoustics so much, but the Loudspeaker Design Cookbook by Vance Dickinson sure. is another one that you could. I mean, it'll it, that, a ton of information about acoustics and sound waves and how it all works. And if you really want to understand how loudspeakers work, the Loudspeaker Design Cookbook. So if you're just online resource stuff you can just browse through uh geek acoustics does have a great series of articles tons of stuff you can learn there and i would also point you to uh, soundproofingcompany.com the soundproofing 101 section that they have lots of great information in there including constructing rooms for soundproofing purposes which is a topic that these other books don't necessarily get into right. so that's tremendously beneficial as well i i think that gives him a darn good start if you read and retain and comprehend all of that you'll know more than i do so yeah you'll be in great stead 
All right, uh, let's try one, maybe two more. Uh, I need to get some lunch here. Andy. <laughs> Andy recently moved to a new condo. His theater area is ki- is a living room plus kitchen combo that's roughly 15 feet front to back, 27 feet wide in total, with his living room theater taking up the right-hand side and open to the kitchen on the left. And it's 10 feet tall. Yeah. It's all hardwood, and the walls are flat and bare right now. He's got a six, uh, six foot by 9-foot area rug in front of his seats, but that's as far as uh, anything soft. Excuse me, at the moment. Yep. <laughs> His three recliner seats aren't right against the back wall, but they are close. All right. He's got a Denon X3300W, a 65-inch LG C7 OLED, Clips Reference 2. Ooh. <laughs> those, those are going to be loud in here. Clips, <laughs> Clips Reference 2 series speakers all around, including their upward fire, firing uh, Atmos modules at the front and a single SVS PB2000 uh, in the front right corner, which he's perfectly happy with since he only cares about his one seat. Everybody else can suck it. <laughs> uh yeah he's he's only a couple of feet off that back wall it looks like yeah pretty much enough to allow the recline to fully happen yeah uh, i mean there's sometimes optical illusion maybe it's two and a half three feet or something like that but relatively close to the wall behind his seats so dialogue intelligibility is the issue he's reached out to, uh, to get for their free advice so he'll find out what they suggest but with his budget of about 700 dollars, what would we recommend he's thinking based on previous advice that his top priority should be two or three panels on his back wall directly behind his head do we agree and then what else uh yeah so the the wall behind him is 100 percent bare there is oh yeah back there. i don't know these seats are hard to judge uh they do look like they have a headrest on it that's quite high but it could again be an optical illusion and he could be sitting above there so he could be getting some absorption from the seat itself it's a leather seat though so it's not it, going to be absorbing much it's not going to be doing, a yeah. ton so no. i yes i agree i think you need that first reflection point on whatever i guess it's the right wall the right uh, side well and I, I mean i would imagine we can see there's you know sort of light coming in there on the right hand yeah. side and this is a setup where it's over to the right side. i would imagine that's a window or a balcony door right. we can't see it in the photos but that's what i would expect is over to the right hand side so maybe it has to be a freestanding panel which that's is fine. fine you can get yeah. yourself a freestanding panel yeah, uh, uh, but yeah, you you want some absorption on the right hand side of your room because it's open on the left. Right. So to make the reflected energy of you're basically getting, I mean, you're getting some, but very little reflected energy to your left that's open to your kitchen. You'd want to try and equal that with some absorption on the right hand side. Right. I, I fully agree. Do that back wall first, though. I, that yeah. back wall is number one culprit. Yeah. And that right wall, if you can't, I get the thick pa- panel. You can reasonably put over there so if you can get a four inch panel over there i would definitely do that because you're trying to make it sound as similar to an empty space which is what is on the other side so uh there's that and then it's just a matter of as much absorption as you can put in this room so yeah because you pretty much can't have too much in this this space space. yep all right uh this question is really long oh no jim it's not long uh, so Jim was reading Kef's uh, How to Get the Most Out of Your Subwoofer Phase and Positioning article. It includes some rules. And rule three says that if for some reason you're forced to orient your subwoofer such that it is directly facing your main speakers, that automatically puts it out of phase with your mains, and you have to flip the polarity switch to zero degrees. Or to 180 from zero degrees. Oh, Sorry, right. I didn't to, type that yeah, up whatever. correctly. Yeah. Anyways, Jim wants to know if this is correct. What the, or what is correct? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, I mean, I have to do a little bit of sleuthing because prior to that, they're talking about how you want to have your subwoofer as close to your front speakers as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which yeah. is also not a thing. But um, if that were the case, then and then they're saying for some reason you have to turn it around and have your sub facing the other way, which what if your sub is downward firing? But let's forget about that. Let's imagine <laughs> it's only forward firing and its ports are also only forward firing. And then you turn it around so it faces the front wall while being right beside your front left and right speakers then yeah technically now that is 180 degrees out of phase okay <laughs> technically and it absolutely makes zero difference but it whatever still doesn't matter <laughs> let me tell you something there jimmy uh out of all the places on the internet to get subwoofer advice the absolute worst is avs forms but 
only slightly <laughs> that's less. That's not necessarily worse. true. You just have to you just have to filter a lot. Yeah, that's you can't filter. Yeah, filter if you it. can filter it, then you don't need the advice. So there you go. <laughs> the second worst place is any speaker manufacturer ever. <laughs> I swear to God, they are good at making speakers. They don't know crap about subwoofers, and it just <laughs> seems to be universally the case. Well, heck, we don't even agree with all the articles on SVS, and they specialize. They in make subwoofers, subwoofers so. and we're like, yeah, don't listen to them. So, you know, especially <laughs> don't listen something. to their stupid tool, right? <laughs> yeah, don't use the subwoofer matching tool that asks you to name your speakers and then because they all they're that. doing is looking at price points and saying. <laughs> If you can afford four thousand dollars worth of speakers, you can afford eight thousand dollars worth of subs. So uh, we don't care that you're in a tw ten by eleven foot bedroom. Right. You need two four thousand series subs. <laughs> that's what'll match your speakers. That'll match those Martin Logans. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's. Don't listen to I that. I mean, it's not impossible that flick flipping your polarity switch might help you in any given subwoofer speaker room situation if that's all you have is a polarity switch sure flick it to the other setting and see what flick happens that switch. No, no harm in trying it but um but no this as a as a rule uh and, well i mean like i say sleuthing back to all the things they said previously almost none of which i agree with <laughs> and i sub I, I mean technically yeah if that's what you did if you put your sub right next to your front speaker and it's forward firing and front ported and all the rest of it and you turned it around that, well, yeah, it is. I mean, they're both pushing out at the same time if the polarity switch is set to zero. So now one is pushing out towards the front wall and one is pushing out towards the back wall. By definition, that is out of phase. Okay. Yeah, but they're not both playing the same thing. I know. <laughs> doesn't make any difference. <laughs> you know? So what, what, do, what position do you put that switch if it's downward firing? Then I what? Know. Or you have a rear port and a front driver. Or you have like a... Like a that Epirian one that's down firing with two side firing with passive, uh, radiators, passive radiators. Yes, I know. Then you have to like take a, the exacto knife and split the switch into We're also threes talking, and then also talking <laughs> bend it. Frequencies where you, your ear will never have registered it until it's bounced off your wall and ceiling probably a couple of Unless times. Unless you're the dude with the sixty foot walls. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, no, don't, don't, don't listen to that and don't think, you know what? I went through all the subwoofer setup advice that AV Rand has ever given me and by the measurements, by my ears, by the sweeps that I've listened to, it all sounds fantastic, but I have my polarity switch set, set at zero and Kef told me to put it at 180 and when I do, everything goes wrong, but they said it's a rule. Nope. Don't do it then. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Not only that, if you, if you listen to our advice and say, you know, you've, you've, you know, done this and that and everything else and it doesn't sound still doesn't sound right but if you switch that switch suddenly it sounds right but we mm. told you not to flick the switch yes. that's fine what sounds right is what sounds right our our advice you know is general rules and you know general knowledge and best practices it's not yes. it's not absolute yeah definitely not we're never been the case that we thought that the, I mean, people have bought speakers that either one of us has owned, headphones that either one of us has owned, and said, hey, we don't like them. And we're like, fine. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And they're like, and they also have said things like, you know, we prefer the Golden Ear or the Klipsch or some other brand that we say has a sound compared to whatever else or you know, Bang & Olufsen compared to something that we've said is neutral and therefore is by definition better. And then we're like, fine. If you like it, it's fine. You know? It's just what it is. We've also had people come on this podcast and say they've had two subwoofers at the front of the room. They're getting even a response across all mm -hmm. their seats. I don't. I mean, it's it's unlikely, but it seems it to have happen. worked in their in their their case. So it is what it is. Don't worry about it. All right, Rob. Who do we have left? We have Ian E. Uh, let's see. Was that all Ian? That is all Ian. All right. That's Jeez, a whole Ian. lot of Ian. That's why uh, Andrew <laughs> Andrew L. <laughs> Uh, Corey W. and uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Josimar? Sure. Josimar? I'm not sure. I'm not scrolling down. Anyway, look at both of them wrote to us on Facebook. And Just Jay. He's Just also on the Jay. list. So we shall answer you next week. All right. This is our podcast, AV Rant, that answers your home theater AV questions. To get your question answered, all you have to do is ask you ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Question at avrant.com. Somebody... Yeah. 
asked on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, Facebook. I was going to say the same thing. Like, saying, they uh, couldn't find an email address for us. I'm like, find you address. have never listened to this podcast, you liar. They said they're a big fan. Big fan that has never heard the question at avrant.com? Question at avrant. I don't know how that was missed, but question at avrant.com, that, that's our email address. I'm sorry I called you a liar. You, I'm glad you're a fan. But at the same time, come on. You couldn't <laughs> find an email address? Come on. All right. <laughs> For AV Rants, I'm Tom Mandry. Are we going to thank our listeners of the week? <laughs> oh, I forgot about them. Let's thank our listeners of the week again. You're out of practice, Tom. I'm out it's of been practice. Two Just weeks. getting back here. I'm That's climbing right. a Moab. Give me a break, man. <laughs> the, the big cloud of Colorado smoke. that I, It killed some of my brain cells. Yep. Uh, let's thank our listeners of the week. Thank our uh, PayPal uh, donators, Stefan, Brandon, Brian, and Tim, as well as our 83 patrons over at Patreon.com. Yeah, Stefan, Brandon, Brian, Tim, thank you very much for donating on PayPal. And thanks so much to our 83 patrons over at patreon.com slash Podcast. if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. We also thank Andy for talking us up to Gick and Thomas for talking us up to SVS and Gary Yakubian. That's right, Andy, Thomas, thank you very much for the support. And uh, yeah, glad you got to chat to those people. Always a good time. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. AV Rant. Now go out and listen to something.